Welcome to this Center for Public Speaking webinar sponsored by IJM Canada. My name is Robin Padani and I am IJM Canada's Director of Development and Mobilization for the Prairies. And uh, in a moment, we're going to give away a copy of IJM founder Gary Haugen's book, The Good News About Injustice, for you webinar attendees here. Now, for those not familiar with IJM, we are International Justice Mission, the world's largest anti-slavery organization. We work across the developing world in countries where those who are mo most risk of being abused, exploited, and enslaved, specifically people in poverty. And in the countries where IJM works, the poorest and most vulnerable are often disproportionately targets of violence and often given the least protection by their local justice system. But IJM is working to change that. For over 20 years, IJM's team of lawyers, social workers, and other professionals work with local justice systems and law enforcement in those countries with a vision to see 500 million people protected from violence by 2030. So that whole communities of men, women, and children are never abused or exploited in the first place. As I see in the chat, people chiming in from all over, I wanted to share one powerful influence in this work of protection, which is IGM's Global Survivor Network. Now this is an independent network of survivors of slavery and other forms of violence that was convened by IGM in 2019 with the goal of making governments move faster to protect their citizens. And IGM has found that the voices of survivor leaders are incredibly difficult for officials to ignore. Now, for all of you tuning in here from all over the world, this is a crucial point. People have inherent dignity and voice. And while the world may ignore their voices or fail to respect their inherent dignity, violence cannot take away those things from people. IJM cannot give them their dignity or voices. It's theirs to begin with. And so I was so excited as a public speaker with International Justice Mission. I've been so looking forward to hearing from our panelists in the webinar today and why IGM was eager to sponsor our webinar today. And so as we kick off our time, I want to give away this copy here of The Good News About Injustice by Gary Haugen, IGM's founder. It's actually not going to be this exact copy that's going to come to you. But Lindsay Smith, Lindsay Smith, as you're registered today for this webinar, you are going to receive a free copy of Gary Haugen's book, The Good News About Injustice. And now it's my joy to invite our MC and my friend Daniel Gilman from the Center for Public Speaking to introduce our incredible panel for today's webinar. Now, I've actually gotten to work with Daniel on public speaking coaching. Um, I got to go through the workshop specifically on uh, eight ingredients of an engaging story. I've already used these principles in my own storytelling and it's something I've even used as something as every day as a, a 10 year anniversary post on Facebook for my wife and I. So Daniel, thank you so much for inviting IGM Canada to be a part of this webinar today and for bringing together our panelists. Hey, thank you so much, Robin. Uh, today, this webinar, which means so much to every one of us tuning in actually resulted from a conversation with Robin. The two of us were speaking about public speaking, about our new endeavor, the Center for Public Speaking. And as we were talking about how difficult it really is to try to use our voices to be a voice for those who people are trying to silence without inadvertently silencing the voice we're trying to speak up for. Uh, in light of our heart for the Center for Public Speaking, coaching people to use their voices to make a beautiful difference in the world, in light of what International Justice Mission does, the two of us were discussing this and we came up with this idea for today's webinar. This is the last of a series of webinars about the art of public speaking the other ones were more about uh, the dynamics of public speaking. Today is about content, about speaking up regarding matters of abuse. I'm coming to you from Niagara Falls, Canada, and today is actually a really heavy day in Canada. It's December 6th everywhere, but here in Canada, December 6th is the 32nd anniversary of a shooting in Montreal where uh, a man went into a CEGEP, uh, into a, a school, and targeted women, killing 10 of them. Every year on this day, we remember the lives that we lost and the horrific reality that continues to this day of abuse targeting women. I know people are tuning in from around the world who are advocates on a variety of issues, whether it's safeguarding women and girls or staying up against violence against men, boys, a whole variety of demographics. We're so glad that you're here. It's a heavy subject we're addressing and so many of you uh, are already making a difference in beautiful ways. I'm grateful that more than 1,174 people have signed up for today's webinar.
to be equipped by these incredible speakers we get to listen to. Our first speaker is someone who has meant the absolute world to me. Uh, she is the first, she was the first to speak publicly of uh, against uh, bringing charges against the infamous USA Gymnastics team doctor. Um, he was one of the most prolific sexual abusers in the history of the world. As a result of Rachel's speaking publicly, over 300 women, including numerous Olympic medalists, came forward as survivors of this doctor's abuse, eventually leading to justice. She is the author of What is a Girl Worth? This amazing book I hold in my hands. And the winner of this book is Megan VB. We're so grateful um, that you're here and you have won this amazing book. Uh, Rachel is an attorney, she's an advocate, she's an author, as well as a beloved and dear friend to my wife and to me and to our baby girl. Uh, she is continuing to track with us at every stage of development, cheering us on and praying for our precious baby daughter. Please give a warm digital welcome to Rachel Van Hollander. Thanks guys, really excited to be here. Uh, trauma-informed best practices for public speakers. All right, so I'm really excited to be here, guys. It's a privilege to be with you all today. I have been looking forward to this for weeks, and I am so encouraged at the number of people who have taken the time to come today. There is so much to explore on this topic, so I'm actually going to start by casting the net a little bit wider today uh, and look forward to engaging on a deeper level uh, through Wade and Diane's presentations and then through our Q&A. What I want to do is give just a brief overview of the categories of needs that we have when we are going to be speaking to the realities of sexual abuse and trauma. And my hope really is to raise awareness of the complexity that we have here so that when we're speaking to the issue of abuse, it's being done with intentionality and with great care. So all of us, especially over the last five years, have begun to have a collective societal awakening uh, with the need to address sexual abuse, whether it's from the pulpit, on our campuses, in our nonprofits, uh, or just around the water cooler at work, you know, in whatever sphere of influence we have. But when we do that, there are three main categories of individuals whose needs have to be balanced whenever we speak on abuse. And those categories are first, audience members who are not survivors, second, audience members who are survivors, and third, the survivors whose stories and experiences we are using to educate and encourage and motivate. And typically when we're speaking on issues of abuse, we're doing so because we want to educate and to motivate. We want our audience to understand something. We want them to understand the problem of abuse, the depth of damage that comes from it, how widespread it is and what trauma does to someone. And then we want them to do something with the information we give them. We want to motivate them maybe to donate or to volunteer, to help spread the word. We want them to examine and change their mindsets or their behaviors. We want to educate and then we want to motivate. And oftentimes we're also seeking to encourage, to give our audience hope that their actions matter and that if in fact they become motivated to do something, what they do will bear fruit. The needs of the audience members who are not survivors typically centers around those three goals, education, motivation, and encouragement. But as we're seeking to accomplish those goals well, we're rightly struck with attention. We need to help non-survivors understand the dynamics and the damage from abuse with enough detail that they are in fact really educated and motivated. Failing to accurately explain the damage from abuse yields an audience that's less motivated to end it or to care well for survivors. Leaving a discussion at statistics and sterile concepts often fails to really engage and encourage and motivate. Jane Doe is really easy to ignore, but real stories that compel an emotional response, not so much. Yet at the same time, if we use a survivor's story carelessly or without obtaining real consent, we once again strip them of their agency and their voice. And often the level of specificity needed to, be tr to truly educate is also deeply painful for survivors in the audience to hear. So there's a real tension that we find. Diane and Wade are gonna speak well to the needs of survivors whose stories are being used. And that's something we can also explore more in depth in our question and answer. So I'm gonna focus a little bit more on balancing the needs of the survivors in the audience. 
because the reality is one in four to one in three women are survivors of domestic or sexual abuse, and at least one in six men are as well. And to understand the needs of the survivors in the audience, we have to understand a concept that's been pretty maligned in recent years, the word triggered. Right now, it's not uncommon to hear that word almost mocked as if it's some made up concept by overly sensitive people who just can't handle the slightest thing. But being triggered is a very real concept with actual science and reality behind it. And it has to do with neurobiology. We have to understand this concept if we're going to care well for survivors in our audience and care well for the survivors whose stories we're using. So I wanna look at the neurobiology of trauma just a little bit. Every time you and I experience something, a neural pathway gets formed in response to that experience. And the more we experience that thing, the faster and the stronger that neural pathway becomes. And because we're multi-sensory beings, those pathways form associations too. The experience forming the pathway comes with sights and sounds and smells. It comes with the words and concepts. Everything that accompany that event gets formed alongside that neural pathway. And with really strong pathways, oftentimes the neural pathway to the memory of an event can be brought up in our minds when one of the associating senses or concepts is experienced again in present time, even if it's a totally different context. A past memory resurfacing from something we're experiencing in the present is the concept of triggering. And we experience this all the time in positive forms. For example, when I was a child, we used to go visit my grandparents frequently on Sundays, and my grandma almost always had an amazing beef or pork roast ready to come out of the oven when we arrived at her home after church. And as funny as it sounds, whenever I smell gravy or a good roast now, I immediately remember walking into my grandmother's home. I remember the warmth, and I remember all the things that come with that memory, a multi-sensory experience. I remember the sound of my grandmother's voice and the words she always said, hi, honey. I remember the smell of her perfume and the way she would pat me on the back and say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. It's amazing to me all of the memories, the sounds, the smells, the sensations, and the emotions that come to the surface when I smell a good pork roast or gravy. But our brain works that way for traumatic memories too. The sights, the sounds, the smells, the words, the concepts that we experience when we experience trauma can mean that a traumatic memory is easily brought to the surface by an associated sensation or word or concept that gets re-experienced in present time. When I remember my grandma, I instantly feel calm and safe and relaxed, and I can't help but smile because those were the chemical responses and the physical responses and the emotions that formed in association with that positive memory. But the opposite happens with traumatic memories. The cortisol and the adrenaline immediately release. And the physical and emotional responses that one experienced during the trauma, panic, fear, helplessness, confusion, resurface when the memory resurfaces. Because those were the chemical, physical, emotional responses that occurred when the neural pathway to that memory was first formed. In fact, traumatic memories are often stored and accessed differently in the brain compared to pleasant memories. The area of the brain that processes current sensory input is what lights up when a survivor is triggered and experiences a flashback. This means that often a survivor doesn't just remember what happened, as bad as that is. They actually re-enter that experience as if it's happening again. They don't just remember the sights and sounds and smells, they actually re-smell and re-hear and re-feel them. This is called a flashback. And it can be so disorienting that the survivor may even need help coming out of it and reorienting to what is actually real and present. And the reality is that when we're talking about abuse, we run a very high risk of triggering these, these memories to resurface in our audience members who are themselves survivors. So there are a couple of things that we can do when we're speaking on abuse to help care well for the needs of survivors in the audience. And these same concepts also apply to the survivors whose stories are being used. First, let your audience know the general content ahead of time. If possible, in time for survivors who may not be ready to engage with that content to simply choose not to come or attend. If at all possible, plan ahead of time to have a few safe people and safe places and spaces available for anyone who might need to step out before or during or after the discussion. These should be individuals who have significant understanding of trauma. When you begin, gently acknowledge the reality that the subject matter is hard and may be triggering. 
to and encourage anyone who needs to step out that they have the freedom to do so and clearly identify where those safe people and those safe places are in case they need help during or after the discussion. Third, educate yourself on where the particular community you are part of or speaking to has gotten it wrong in the past. In a sports context, for example, it's very common to minimize sexual violence or harassment as just locker room talk. So you would want to avoid that phrase in a minimizing context when you're talking to a sports audience in particular. In a church context, certain stories like David and Bathsheba or Joseph and Potiphar or passages on justice are routinely exposited inaccurately and in very damaging ways to survivors. Knowing the common ways that victims have been harmed by that community and being intentional about steering very clear of re-emphasizing or redoing that harm, steering clear of words or teaching that utilizes incorrect ideas or has damaged survivors can help minimize the triggering in your presentation. Four, use accurate language. Sex with a minor isn't sex with a minor, it's child rape. Sexually predatory behavior isn't unfaithfulness, it's abuse. Be very aware of language that minimizes or, or downplays or uh, excuses sexually abusive behavior. Know how certain concepts connected to abuse have been wielded like weapons before. And as much as possible, be sure to include the counterbalance to it in your presentation. For example, in religious contexts in particular, concepts of forgiveness or unity are often used against survivors to keep them silent. So if you are telling a beautiful story about a survivor who has extended forgiveness to their abuser or the hope that comes after forgiveness, be very sure to articulate clearly what forgiveness isn't, that it isn't being silent. It's not reestablishing a relationship or reconciliation with a dangerous person. It doesn't exist in contrast to justice, but rather in tandem with it. Be sure to give the counterbalance to the points that you are using. And these these concepts are going to remain true for the survivors whose stories you are using. But very briefly, when it comes to using survivor stories, it's also important to balance the needs of the survivors whose stories you are utilizing. And a very basic framework principle to use is doing everything you can to undo the damage that was done. So being aware of the damage that comes from abuse and then making sure that your engagement with the survivor and your utilization of their story is intentionally undoing those dynamics. So in abuse, a survivor's choice and voice and agency are stripped. When you are discussing with a survivor whether or not their story is going to be used in a presentation you give, you need to be engaging very clearly, very accurately, and ensuring that you have full consent of that survivor before using their story. This requires a level of intentionality and continual engagement, inviting questions. What parts of the story, is there anything you don't want me to say? Are there words that are triggering for you that you don't want me to use? Some survivors uh, who are Nasser survivors don't want Nasser's name used when their story is used. Be aware and intentional about opening those doors of communication and engaging the survivor's consent at every point in time. And I highly encourage doing this in writing as much as possible so that there can be adequate time for the survivor to step away and to emotionally process their request being made of them to be able to ensure that full consent is given. It's critical to be able to discuss issues of abuse, but when we do so, we have to be very sure that the way we discuss and use those stories and the way we engage with survivors in our audience doesn't re-damage re uh, and continue those same dynamics. With intentionality as we approach, we can care well for all of these needs and do a good job uh, articulating and educating and empowering. to get to hear you equip us and everyone will get to see Rachel again real soon. Um, after the next two speakers, we're gonna do Q&A. So even now you're welcome everyone to start submitting your questions. And so um, Rachel, you're welcome to turn off your video and then you can come back up um, at the, after the next two speakers for Q&A. Our next speaker has practiced counseling for about 47 years. She has worked with returning Vietnam vets where she first began uh, discovering um, some of the realities of PTSD and trauma, and she was on the forefront of uncovering some of those realities, and then began seeing some of those same exact signs from war in survivors of domestic violence and various forms of abuse 
at home. She has shaped the way that professional counselors, therapists, psychologists understand trauma, abuse, and suffering around the world. I was so blessed and introduced to her work uh, when my own grief therapist a year ago introduced me to, and by introduce it, I have to read Suffering in the Heart of God. It's such a good book and provided clarity and encouragement to my wife and I when we were in such a tough season. Uh, I also have loved her book, Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church. And we're giving this a book away right now to the winner being Mark Hutchins in Texas. This book is yours. I'll be on its way shortly. Uh, to everyone else, please give a warm digital welcome to Dr. Diane Langford. Thank you, Daniel. I'm grateful to be here with all of you. And I want to uh, contribute a little more that works right in very well with what Rachel has just been saying to us about victims and how to care for them in the process of telling stories. Human beings learn about the abstract through the concrete. So whatever understanding you and I have about such lofty words as love, trust, or safety come from our experiences with other people who either demonstrated those qualities in some way and it got labeled for us. But what happens when daddy says he loves mommy and then he beats her up? Or what teaching occurs when a youth pastor teaches about God's love and molests the girls that he is teaching? Or what does an abuse victim seeking safety learn if she comes to her pastor for help and he suggests her sexual abuse never happened and if she keeps talking about it, she will be destroying God's work? But not only do children learn about the abstract by way of the concrete, as adults, we continue to learn that way because we are taught about the unseen through the seen. You think about it, God teaches eternal truths through the natural world. We understand a little bit about what the word eternity means by looking at the sea. Or we learn about the shortness of time by the quickness of a vapor disappearing. Jesus taught the same way. I mean, if you think about it, he said some pretty strange things. I'm bread, I'm light, I'm living water, I'm a vine. He said, I'm a door. And the really odd thing is we actually understand what he's talking about. This method is used all the way through understanding the character of God, God in the flesh. God explains himself to us through the temporal. So you want to understand how God thinks about children and their care? then you watch God in the flesh when he was with children. You want to know what he thinks about women? Watch Jesus with women. You understand, want to understand about how he responds to the diseased or the poor or the abused? Watch him in the flesh. And ultimately, of course, what that means is that anything that you and I or do with other humans or to them that is not like him teaches lies about God. I fear that we in the church world have down through the centuries broken God's heart with the lies we have taught others by our lives. We have grievously, like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, taught these lies by words and by deed and by cover-up, reserving our places, positions, institutions at the expense of the most vulnerable among us. We have gathered up the power of our systems and crushed already broken lambs, silencing their stories of harm. So how do we speak? How do we teach about or walk with survivors who must might be living out in the flesh the opposite of the crushing, silencing, and diminishing of abuse? They don't know what it is like not to be abused. How are we to walk with them and demonstrate safety? There are men, women, and children in all of our churches and organizations and schools who have suffered and continue to suffer from abuse of many kinds. Most of them never tell their stories. Some tried to tell and were not to believe, believed or their stories were told without any care for them at all. Many have never heard what God has to say about such life-shaping evil. 
and some of them have experienced that abuse in the confines of a church or Christian organization, and it has been done in God's name. Oftentimes, out of desperation and great courage, victims will step forward to tell the truth of their lives, truth that has never been spoken before. And when they do that, they will need safety, understanding, and support. Who we are and how we help them tell the truth of their lives matters greatly. So if you are to give support and help to others and to help them tell their stories, you will need to grasp and be governed by one particular underlying principle. A healing response to abuse is characterized by the reversal of the dynamics of that abuse. Let me say it again, a healing response to abuse is characterized by the reversal of the dynamics of that abuse. Acts, in acts of abuse, thoughts, feelings, and the pain of the victim do not matter. Victims have no voice. In a healing response, the victim is given room to speak, however slowly or repetitiously, to an attentive ear, who responds with an empathic response. God gave humans voices. Abuse twists, silences, voice. No matter how good your intentions, using your place, power, or position to silence or to override and pressure the voice of a victim is to yet again do damage. And sadly, many have attempting to help done more damage. Abuse also violates relationship and not only silences, it exploits, it violates, it forces and destroys God-given dignity. Abuse involves deception, betrayal, abuse of power. It involves destruction of trust and safety, humiliation. In a healing response, the victim is always safe always treated with respect, always given voice, and always honored. Abuse also crushes power, which is God-given, just like voice. In healing, power is never abused. Respect is given. Truth is always told and honor is shown. In abuse, power is robbed, dignity stolen and shaming helplessness occurs. In a healing response, power is restored. And so we ask questions like, what do you think about that? What would you like to do? What is your choice? What are your goals? Please let me know when you need to stop. The power held by anyone privileged to walk aside any abuse survivor is ever and always then used as good for the survivor. That power is never used to feed myself or yourself. It is never protected to feed or protect an organization. And the power is not used in order to produce a published story. Restoring voice living out safety in relationship and the use of power that is carefully done must be present and ongoing. To walk with a victim in any circumstance is to walk with vulnerability, great pain and fear. We will want them to go faster. We will want them to speak more. We will want them to feel safe more quickly. We will want them to be hopeful. And if we are honest, I think we will recognize that our push for those things is because the truth, the damage, and the long road are discouraged, discouraging us and disturbing our faith and bringing us grief as well. And like the victim, we do not welcome those things. In my experience with this work, God is always working both sides. 
You cannot walk with a survivor. You cannot counsel a survivor. You cannot pastor a survivor. You cannot write an article about a survivor without the fact that God is working with you as much as he is with the victim. So yes, I am there to strengthen another's voice about a story no one wants to be true. Yes, I am there to create a safe relationship that restores dignity and that bestows power in a crushed life. But I am also there because there is much for me to learn about my Lord who did and does all of these things with me. I fear we have missed him in our refusal to face the truth about abuse in our so-called Christian world, which is only truly of Christ when we look like him. I have been back to and forth to Rwanda many times and have learned many lessons in that beautiful country where disdain and hatred for fellow citizens led to the slaughter of about a million people precious to our God. <clears throat> Human voice, safety and relationship, and power were absolutely crushed in Rwanda. As I was getting ready to return home one time after presenting some talks on trauma, a Rwandan man came up to me and asked to speak with me. And he said the following, before you came, we were like dead sticks. We had no value. But then you came, you listened, and you walked with us, and you believed us, and now we know that we are not dead sticks. We are human beings, and now we have hope. Many of you listening today are leaders in some capacity. Some of you are here listening because you recognize the devastation, not only in the church, but committed by the people of God. Because you see, like Rwanda, we too have slaughtered the hearts and minds of our fellow citizens. I believe that this crisis is a call to the global church, to repentance. We have failed God. We have most certainly failed the sheep he has called us to feed. We were never meant to explore, exploit, or ignore sheep. He is calling us to grasp the truth that love and obedience to Christ is our primary work, even if our temples are all falling down. He is using those we have discarded and silenced, the least of these, to call us to listen and to restore another's silenced voice. By walking with them patiently, with love and with humility, with those that we have dismissed, and he has called us to use our power not to accomplish great things that serve us, but to use our power to enter into suffering and into the devastation of a ignored soul. If we bow to this work and do it bearing his likeness, we will, as he did, bring down into the flesh life and hope to dead places, both to victims and you will see also to ourselves. Thank you. Dr. Langberg, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, our next speaker is someone who has served for 10 years in pastoral ministry and then five years as, as a seminary program director and professor before transitioning now to full-time research and writing. He also does speaking and advocacy, and we're grateful to have him with us. He's been serving as an institutional response specialist with Grace since 2020. Grace is a ministry that has meant so much to so many of us on this call. It was his work in the local church that first introduced him to the needs of abuse victims and the potential for institutional betrayal and trauma when those who are supposed to protect victims choose to protect the abusers. His recent book, Something's Not Right, and the, um, decoding the hidden tactics of abuse and freeing yourself from its power has proven a profoundly helpful book to so many of us on this call. And the winner of this book is Heidi Vogel. This book is yours. 
Everyone, please give a warm digital welcome to Dr. Wade Mullen. Thank you, Daniel. I'm grateful uh, for everyone who's on this webinar. It's encouraging to know that so many are participating in this discussion. I wanna start with a brief story. In his book, King Leopold's Ghost, Adam Hochschild describes how in the late 1880s, King Leopold II of Belgium turned what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo into his own private colony. He established a system of forced labor that was largely hidden from the world at the time and used that system to accumulate a vast wealth by stealing valuable resources like ivory and wild rubber. Those who knew of the abuses, such as missionaries to the region, had difficulty sounding the alarm because they just didn't have a wide enough audience. And that began to change, according to Hawk Hochschild, when a man who was working for a British shipping firm, a man named Edmund Dean Morrell, began to notice that when the ships came back to Europe, they were filled with rubber and ivory. But when the ships returned to Africa, they carried nothing to exchange for these resources, but instead were loaded with soldiers and weapons. And he realized that he was observing evidence of a forced labor system thousands of miles away. So he blew a whistle. He went to the head of the shipping company and the shipping company responded by trying to move him somewhere else in the company. And when that didn't work, they tried to buy his silence. And when that didn't work, Morrell ended up quitting in protest. And over the next three to five years, he turned himself into the great British investigative journalist of his time. He was filled with this righteous anger that he was a cog in this system. And for about 12 years, he devoted himself full time to telling the world the stories of this forced labor system. According to Hochschild, Morrell wrote 36 pamphlets, three books, hundreds of articles, published his own newspaper. And as word got out, more and more people began to take collective action, which is often what is needed for something to be exposed. He started working with churches and leaders throughout the world. And over the course of about 10 years, they organized more than 900 public meetings protesting and bringing awareness to King Leopold's abuses in the Congo. I share that story to highlight how important it is we speak about abuse and we need more who are willing to do so. But it's also important that when we speak about abuse, we do not risk further exploiting and traumatizing those who have been victimized. In my own life and work, I've observed a few specific ways in which speakers can exploit survivors. And I'd like to mention three for you to be aware of. And then I'll close with three principles for speaking about abuse with integrity. First, an organization or a leader with its own history of exploitation might start speaking about abuse as a way of atoning for their past or distancing themselves from their own behavior in order to repair their image. This is particularly dangerous if the organization or the leader speaks about abuse because they want a different future without facing the truth of their past. And I would encourage those who perhaps are coming out of systems and organizations where there has been a wake of trauma and harm that before you hurry to speak about abuse that's out there, you need to first speak truthfully about the abusive behavior in your own midst, confront the abuse in your own midst, and spend a great deal of time listening to those who have been harmed. Otherwise, when such organizations and leaders do begin to speak about abuse, they can very easily see that effort as a way to repair their image. Second, an organization or a leader might see a movement like Me Too or Church Too as an opportunity to profit. So they start speaking about abuse because they believe there's a market for that kind of content. So they set up a kind of pop-up shop and begin to sell their newfound advocacy 
but as soon as it's no longer in demand, they move to the next popular topic. Third, an organization or a leader might speak about abuse because they see themselves as an authority on every subject matter. And I think this is probably the more uh, common example. Perhaps they feel that their role as the leader or as the pastor or as the CEO demands that they show themselves to be competent on every subject. So they begin to speak out of a place of overconfidence, thinking they know what they need to know. And they do more harm than good because they haven't taken the time to listen and to learn. The common thread through each of these three examples is a desire on the part of the speaker to project and maintain a definition for an audience, perhaps of being safe or of being welcoming or a place free of the scandals plaguing other institutions and leaders. So they put on a performance to maintain the favor of their audience and view those whose stories of abuse they tell merely as individuals with roles to play in their performance. The concern, therefore, is not a moral and ethical concern, which is a particular danger for those who are in positions of trust, because our concerns for what is good and right can become divorced from goodness itself, so that we only want to be seen as on the side of what is right, or to be more precise, what we believe our audience believes is right thereby reducing a survivor story of trauma to some lines in a script prepared for an audience. Now, each of these forms of exploitation risk further harm to those victimized by abuse because they fundamentally view survivors as objects to be used for personal gain. And so they take possession of a survivor story and they trim it and they fold it and press it down until it fits within a mold of their own creation. By its nature, abuse is about power, it's about domination, it's about having possession over others, often gained and maintained through deception, and it produces things like confusion and captivity. So to take a survivor story and to treat it however you desire, to gain possession of another story for your own gain, is to dishonor and betray that person. When you are free of these exploitive desires, then you can focus on a process that honors the survivor and their story because it is not about you, the speaker, or about what your institution or system wants, about their image or your image, but it's about serving the needs of the survivor. And I'd like to suggest three principles for speaking about abuse with integrity. And much of this reinforces what Diane and Dr. Langberg have already shared. First, we must name the abuse accurately. For example, the pastor did not have an affair with the congregant who was seeing him for counseling. He abused his position of trust. He abused his power to commit sexual abuse. When we fail to name abuse accurately, when we fail to say, this is abuse, we minimize the gravity of the harm we soften the nature of the offense, and we make a mockery of the truth. And we set survivors up, victims up, to be further harmed by a community who perhaps, for example, sees the victim as somebody who ought to share equal blame. And so many people have been tragically harmed by communities because their abuse was not accurately defined and named and described. Second, we must be sensitive to the traumatic experiences of those we are addressing. We must be mindful that there are others in the audience who might have similar stories, who likely have similar stories. Dr. Judith Herman, in her article on justice from the victim's perspective, which you can find online, discusses how survivors need to be able to control or limit their exposure to specific reminders of their own trauma to those triggers that Rachel discussed. So members of the audience should be given choices before they're even in the room, whether or not they want to participate. At the start of a message, throughout the message, they should be given freedom to disengage or to leave. They should be given connection, access to trauma-informed support. 
And then third, we must commit to and prepare for future disclosures. How we tell a story of abuse and of trauma will either cast a light or cast a shadow. When leadership casts light, people feel they can be more transparent because they find safety, truth, and freedom in that light. But when leaders cast shadows, perhaps through their ignorance or their silence or by repeating twisted and false narratives, then people hold their stories close because they fear what will happen if they dare to be transparent. But when people discover you are willing with integrity and compassion to shine a light on the stories of abuse hidden in the shadows, then they might come to you with their own story. Therefore, the decision to speak about abuse must be made with the knowledge that others may approach you with similar stories. And you have to determine what you will do with those stories. Who will you be? Who will you refer them to for help? What resources will you make available? What laws might you need to be familiar with? So just to recap, speaking about abuse is important and necessary, but it must be done in ways that are not exploitive. By not speaking about abuse to simply atone for your own past or the past of your institution or system, or to make a profit or to benefit in some way, or to assert your authority or expertise. And it must be done in ways that name the abuse accurately, is sensitive to the traumatic experiences of your audience, and commits to and prepares for future disclosures from other survivors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mullen. And I'd like to bring back Dr. Langberg and Rachel Dunn-Hollander as well to join us for a time of Q&A. Uh, now, I've received texts and messages from uh, DMs as this has been going on from people saying, can we please go over time? And in some ways, that's not in some ways. In all ways, that's a question for the panelists. Uh, I was able to confirm with Rachel that she's able to stay on a few minutes after the ending at the hour. So um, our other panelists are welcome to stay on or um, if you need to go, that's OK, too. Um, people are also putting in the chat box one of the questions that keeps coming up is where can I find their books? You can find their books anywhere that sells books, including amazon.com, amazon.ca, and all the other uh, global endings to Amazon. Uh, we're gonna give away another book right now and then still another, the Rachel Den Hollander ultimate uh, book package at the end. Uh, so the next book we're gonna give away is actually a book that came out last week and was written by my brother, Josh. It's a picture book for children. It's called The King's Daughter. And it beautifully speaks about the unshakable value and worth of every precious little girl. And it, it, it handles matters of abuse in a very sensitive way that one can read to a child, kind of safeguarding them and um, about their value and worth. It's beautiful. And the winner of this book is Petrina Gomez, tuning in from Singapore. That book is yours. Now we're gonna jump into the questions. Questions are pouring in. Um, the first question is, how do you balance the need to not minimize abuse while being sensitive to an audience where children are or may be present? I, I can take a shot at that one. I'm, I'm sure Wade and Diane have a lot to add to. To be honest, I really try not to have children present if we are trying to really dig into the issues of sexual abuse because so much of what we're going to discuss uh, is something that children really shouldn't be present for and shouldn't be exposed to yet. Uh, so as much as possible, I try to age segregate. So I speak to junior high students, high school students, elementary school, you know, school students, I speak at family conferences, uh, but we really try not to have children there when we're digging into the issues of abuse. Uh, and then if there are, those are topics that we want to cover with children, we age segregate them so that we can handle it in a way that's uh, that's appropriate. The one exception to that is when I'm dealing with uh, audiences where I know there's a significant amount of abuse. Uh, so sometimes I am brought in uh, to speak to children's groups uh, because they have experienced abuse. In that case, they've already lived those realities, and so they need to know that those realities are heard and seen. Outside of that dynamic, I do think age segregation is very important when we're discussing issues of abuse. A follow-up question, and uh, any of you can jump in on this as well. Um, Rachel, for, I know there's we've more than 200 pastors have tuned in and are watching. Um, we would 
I would suggest that when pastors are speaking and there's a passage that deals with matters of abuse and exploitation, it could be helpful for the whole congregation to hear them unpack some of those dynamics. So what are some best practices for pastors who might be speaking to a family integrated church where there's children involved? Yeah, so if you're if you're dealing with expository preaching, you're going to come across passages that relate to abuse and tangentially you're going to also uh, because a lot of the passages that talk about marriage or divorce or justice, uh, those are passages that you really ought to be taking the opportunity uh, to explore those issues. Uh, but be very, uh, my recommendation is be very careful of the language that you use. It's not necessary to use overly graphic language, but you can use very careful and intentional language that signals to your adult audience that you understand the dynamics of abuse. You don't have to get graphic to be able to explore power dynamics. You don't have to get graphic to deal with the reality that domestic abuse exists when you're preaching on passages that deal with, say, divorce. Uh, so graphicness is not always required. That being said, I do suggest a level of intentionality for adults that can dig deeper into those topics. Uh, you know, when we're, when we're talking about church ministry, there's so much we do with churches that's intentional. And if you were looking out at your congregation and you knew a quarter to a third of my congregation was uh, battling cancer or fighting unemployment or had recently experienced a death in the family, you would probably have a level of intentional ministry for those people. Maybe it's meal trains to help uh, provide for their physical needs while they're healing from chemotherapy or they're grieving the death of a loved one. Maybe it's a grief support group. And maybe it's a Bible study uh, that's going through uh, how to, you know, how to respond to God or engage with God in the face of suffering. There would be a level of intentionality that you would have if you knew that a certain number of your congregants, a high statistical percentage of your congregants were, were or had experienced this type of suffering. But somehow when it comes to issues of sexual and domestic violence, we don't have that level of intentionality. So yes, exposit those passages. You can do it in ways that are age appropriate and with language that's very careful to articulate that you do understand abuse and abusive dynamics and opens the door and shines a light. But at the same time, I also suggest a, a significant level of intentionality for being able to explore those topics in an age appropriate and adult context. Thank you. Would either of you like to jump in? Uh, just two things. One is it's sometimes helpful to uh, people to understand that the literal meaning of the word abuse, which I think goes back to the Latin, is to use someone wrongly. And when that definition is used, I mean, children use each other wrongly too. It has nothing to do with anything sexual. It's a concept that can be said to all People who have been abused will understand how it applies to them as well in a circumstance where somebody can't be outspoken about details or something like that. But we, we use the word so freely, but we don't really know what we're saying. And if we're really deliberate about what it means, that's helpful. The, the other thing I would just say is that I've been getting um, more and more calls and requests from leaders in churches about how to lead well in terms of these areas, but also how to provide for victims in terms of who get people getting trained in their church and all kinds of things like that. And there are programs, there's a healing the wounds of trauma uh, teaching that comes through the American Bible Society that's been used all over the world uh, that it teaches people how to facilitate small groups for traumatized people. Uh, so, that, and there are many other ways as well, but I, I just think we need to bring the whole church into this so that there are appropriate and safe avenues for discussing things more boldly than say, standing up in front of a hundred people in a Sunday school class or in a pulpit. Thank you. And I would just add that I think it speaks to the importance of preparation and being intentional and being careful uh, knowing your audience. I would also add that you know, there are dynamics of exploitation and abuse that children experience. Um, bullying in a school setting is going to create feelings of fear and confusion and captivity. And so I think there are ways in which those dynamics can be discussed in um, inappropriate ways. And I think it's also important that abuse be named accurately, and you can do that. And perhaps that's even more important than necessarily getting into graphic details. Thank you. Um, the next question is that there's a number 
of us in this call who work in fundraising for organizations doing beautiful work on exploitation. Um, we want to raise money to help more people get services. I'm certain uh, a lot of us have been told to tell stories. So how can you tell stories about abuse in a way that is compelling, but still honoring to the victims and survivors that we exist to serve? One of the ways that, that first of all, you have to measure the intensity and boldness and stuff of what you're doing in general, because you've got people in your audience who may have a lot of money to give to your cause, but who grew up abused and they've never dealt with it. So you, you always have to keep that in mind. Um, but I, I, I think that people, we, we don't have to tell a particular person's story. You know, if you, I'm, you work with abuse for as many decades as I have, you know, I can tell you a story about abuse that has like five people in it. I'm not telling a particular person's story. And there's some safety in that for people. Uh, and nobody that has ever seen me has to run around wondering if I'm gonna use them as the next example. I'm not. And frankly, I think it would not be ethical for me to do that. But I do, you need stories, but, but it doesn't have to be only one person's story. It can be three people in the same story. Um, and it's a way of protecting the one whose one story you would have liked to have told. Thank you. Typically, I, I typically do uh, a lot of, of what Diane does. You, know, you can speak to the realities of abuse, the dynamics of abuse, the damage from abuse, what a trigger's like, what a flashback's like. You can speak to all of those things in concepts and in generalities without saying survivor A experiences this. Uh, so when I'm talking about the neurobiology of trauma, I talk about the coping mechanisms that survivors use and why, uh, but it's not drawn from one particular survivor story. There are no identifying features in it. Rather, it's a conglomeration of, hey, this is what it looks like. Uh, if for some reason you feel that there is a particular survivor story that is really helpful for your audience, uh, there, there are kind of three principles. Uh, that I think are really important and that all center around the idea of consent, just like Diane was saying earlier. And like I said earlier, you undoing abuse is the reversal of those dynamics. So if you feel like there is a particular survivor story that just would be incredibly powerful and impactful, or you're in the process of helping a survivor uh, and you have somebody who wants their story to be used. Sometimes I do, I do uh, have, have that dynamic where someone will write to me and say, hey, this is my story. Please use it to help educate others. Tell people what happened to me so people understand. If you're in, the, in that kind of a process, consent and how you obtain consent has to be very carefully done. If you can't obtain consent, true, full, valid consent, you should not be using an individual survivor story. If we are talking about engaged consent, there, I think there are three principles that are really important. Consent is never manipulated, it's clear, and it requires full engagement with the survivor. So it's not manipulated. This means you need to be very aware of language or attitudes or concepts that may make a survivor feel indirectly pressured to say yes to using their story or using parts of their story. Uh, and oftentimes when survivors are finally finding their voice, they are desperate to see their pain mean something. And so they want to help. But this can result in a, in a dynamic where they feel very pressured to allow their story to be used because they so badly want to save others. You need to be aware of that internal and external pressure and how you engage with the survivor and those external dynamics to make sure that you are opening the door for valid consent, that you are being very specific with what you're asking, uh, and that you are doing everything you can to make sure there is not indirect internal or external pressure that's making the survivor uh, want to say yes or feel like they need to say yes. Consent needs to be very clear. This means if you're going to be asking to use a survivor story, you need to be very explicit with exactly what you're asking for. I would, you know, I, I think it would be very powerful to tell your story to this audience, and this is why I think it would be powerful, and then work with the survivor uh, to make sure that there's full engagement with that consent. What parts are you comfortable with me sharing? Are there any words or dynamics you want me to expressly avoid? Are there parts of the story that you really want me to share? Have those conversations, invite those discussions, and then at every point in the process, consent needs to be re-engaged. Uh, so I never use any survivor story uh, unless I have had a specific discussion with them and then I have sent them their story in writing. 
And I never consent to my story being used unless I have actually looked at how that story is going to be used. And I've consented to the words, the language, the associations. This also means you need to be very aware of any external political dynamics or personal benefit that you might be receiving from telling that story and make sure that there's full disclosure. So often I see people using survivor stories and going, oh, well, you know, they're public about their story anyway, but then they're taking that story and they're using it for some type of personal gain, whether it's a policy objective that they want to make or uh, they've got a personal goal, you know, they're candidating to be a pastor or they're applying for a job and they want to show that they're trauma informed. They have some kind of personal benefit they're receiving from using that survivor story or some kind of political or external goal they want to achieve by using that survivor story. Unless the survivor is aligned with that goal and wants you to use their story to achieve that goal, you should not ever be using that survivor story because what you're really doing is re-victimizing and reusing them. You're making them into uh, essentially a football that's used for political points. It is redoing that dynamic of stripping them of their agency and using them as an object to reach a particular goal. So if you reach a point where you really feel like a particular survivor story is very important for uh, some type of work that you're doing, you need to be uh, doing significant examination about any kind of interpersonal uh, benefit that you might receive from it or any kind of politics that might be under the surface so that you are not re-victimizing and reusing that survivor. And then when you obtain consent, it has to be not manipulated and very unpressured, which takes a lot of intentionality and knowledge of the dynamics that might cause a survivor to feel pressured, including your voice, your words, your tone of, you know, your tone of speech. Consent has to be very clear and it has to be with full engagement of the survivor at every point in time. Otherwise, you are not undoing the damage that was done. Thank you. I would like to add one thing to that because the word you used was those who have, are being exploited in terms of fundraising. Um, the other question is the level of danger because many who have been exploited around the world, if they tell their story or they hear or people hear they told their story, they'll be dead tomorrow. And so I, I think that a lot of knowledge and wisdom and care about that needs to be front and center. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from uh, someone who is preparing to testify in a case of, um, I'll just read you. It's a little long, but it's worth reading in full. I will soon be testifying in front of a panel convened to investigate allegations of sexual, physical, and emotional abuse at a powerful and wealthy fundamentalist organization here in South Africa. I've been trying for 25 years to have authorities investigate this place. And it's finally happening. I've written testimonies of 71. I have received the written testimonies of 71 other survivors and their permission to use their words in my testimony. It's a grave responsibility that has been weighing heavily on me. My question is this, if there are any tips on regaining one's composure when it just gets really hard. Since the publication of my memoir, I've had many public interviews and somehow reading other survivor stories in their own words has me weeping every single time. I don't mind crying in public, but I don't want to break down completely. One of the things I have often done with victims who have had to go to court, uh, certainly not on the scale that this person is talking about, but they're terrified and they're afraid they'll fall apart on the stand or whatever, is that I, and it could be one person or several people, I have written a note for them. And we've gone over it together. They know what it says in terms of who they are and uh, how, what they're choosing to do and their character and things like that. It's just a brief note and they put it in a pocket. And every time they feel overwhelmed, they put their hand in their pocket. And it helps ground them back to, number one, Diane's out there somewhere. She knows I'm doing this. She believes these things. And number two, it reminds me of why I'm here doing this and I can cry later. It, it doesn't work 100%, but it, it's a tie to something that's very grounding for many people. Thank you. I think there are a couple of dynamics with that that have been really helpful for me. Um, the first one is just in terms of relieving the external pressure is remembering that success is faithfulness with what I've been given. So my, my healing, my validation, my identity, my definition of success is not dependent on the societal response I receive because that's outside of my control. 
but the truth is also not dependent on the societal response I can receive. I can tell the truth and the societal response I receive does not change what that truth is. And the ability to hold on to what is true uh, and to know where my identity and my value come from and to know that success is faithfulness with what I have been given helps relieve that external pressure of feeling like it's all been for nothing if I don't reach a particular result. Uh, I think something else that's also really important for survivors to remember is that the shame doesn't lie with you. Uh, when I was getting ready to, to testify in the preliminary hearing, I had a friend of mine who said something just really powerful. He said, every word you speak puts the shame and blame back where it belongs, on your abuser and not on you. And I really held to that when I was going into court, that every word I spoke, as dirty and awful as it felt, was putting the shame and blame back. It was holding up all of the dirt and the ugly and saying, this is not mine. This is his. Uh, and at one point in time, the defense attorney uh, asked me, it was, was really hitting me for why I did so many press interviews. And I just looked at her and I said, I'm going to take every opportunity I have to show that the shame and the blame does not lie with me and to tell the truth. So remembering that every word you speak, as, as horrible as it is to have to speak those words, it is an act of putting the shame and blame back on the person to whom it belongs and lifting it off of you. And then I also find it very helpful essentially to switch gears. Uh, you know, there is, there is a role for grieving with those who are grieving and for grieving over what you have suffered. And then there's also an advocacy role. And sometimes you have to switch between one or the other. Uh, and so I am very intentional about being in an advocacy role when I am entering court or I'm walking with survivors who are entering into court and I am going in fighting for them, fighting for their voices, fighting for their, uh, for their safety and for their value and for their worth and being engaged in an advocacy context rather than emotionally engaged in a grieving context helps you be able to be powerful and impactful with your words and not minimize the depth of the damage and the grief and the evil that it was because it was, but also not get so lost in it that you're not able to be effective as an advocate. Uh, and the civil, one of the civil attorneys that I worked with um, said to me when I was, you know, when I was going to court, I found it most helpful to be thinking about the other women and little girls that I was fighting for. But his recommendation to a lot of survivors that aren't able to flip into that role is fight for the child that you were. Remember who you were as that little 12 year old girl, that little eight year old girl, a little boy, put your arm around that little child that you couldn't protect. And when you go in there, you speak for that child. That ability to flip into the advocacy role helps you not minimize the depth of the damage and the evil, but it also helps keep you from being so lost in it that you're not able to be effective as an advocate. And then like Diane said, planning a lot of time and space afterwards for the grieving process, because it's gonna come and it should come. And I would add that, you know, it's okay to feel like you may not get through something like that because you're carrying such a weight of pain. And what I have found to be helpful personally is to know the specific ways in which I might begin to buckle under that weight and to, with the help of a therapist, be aware that Hey, maybe if I had a warm cup of tea with me, or maybe if I took, you know, a deep breath, there are specific things that, you know, you can do to help you get through that experience. And then for me personally too, it's been helpful to keep in mind the hope that is present in that action, that perhaps there's good that is going to be accomplished as a result of this, and also to be able to see through all of the evil to the beauty that's on the other side of that. So one thing that I've learned to remind myself is that evil is an assault on beauty. And when I'm facing stories of tremendous evil, I try to see the beauty that that evil is attempting to snuff out. And then to appreciate that beauty and to try to set my eyes on, on that as much as I can. That kind of helps me keep going. Thank you. There's so many more questions pouring in, um, but I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you, the three of you, for coming out, staying over time. Um, for those who, there's so much more people want to learn from you. 
I will send out the links to all the books that we have mentioned today, because uh, a lot of the answers to people's questions will be there. And if they're not, you can always um, follow these incredible people on Twitter. I have learned so much from them and the way to be concise and say so much from these three's Twitter. Uh, so I'll just say thank you so much. There's still a little bit more announcements afterward, but I'll let the three of you go. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for uh, handling our really uh, heavy questions we, and also for your ongoing advocacy and courage. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank Thanks, you, Daniel. real privilege to be here. Um, well, in a moment, I'm going to call up Robin back and he is going to give away the last set of books. Uh, but just before that, I do want to let you know, usually here at the end, uh, we announce the next webinar, uh, but um, partly because my wife and I are expecting a baby and uh, we're kind of more in gearing up for preparing to receive our daughter than the next event. Uh, it's going to be a bit of time before the next webinar. Uh, when you were signing up to be here today, I'm so grateful that you did. There was the option to say if you wanted to hear about more events or not. Um, quite a number of you said yes. Of course, some of you said no. A lot of us don't want any more emails or invites. It's overwhelming. Uh, but if you are interested in more of these free events, equipping you to use your voice to make a beautiful difference in the world, uh, if you think you might have said no, please just let me know to switch it to a yes. I'll let you know when we know when the next event is. Um, that's all my announcements besides just saying thank you so much for being here. Uh, we so desperately want to make the world, uh, the world in politics, the world in the church, the world in every single context more safe and more wholesome. And your being here, you're taking the time to be further equipped by these three speakers today is going to help all of us be able to do that better. And so it means so much to us that you've been here. And I want to bring up Robin back for the conclusion of our time together. Robin, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for everyone who's still on and who signed up for this and registered. We have one more book giveaway. So I'm glad you held on to the end for those of you who did. The ultimate Rachel Den Hollander book giveaway is going to be going to Heather Shooten. Heather Shooten, you have won the ultimate Rachel Den Hollander book giveaway. And I also wanted to just say, as you're looking in your communities for opportunities to uh, advocate for the oppressed, to amplify survivor voices in your communities, please let us here at IJM Canada be a resource for you. Uh, we have over 20 years of stress-tested casework walking along survivors of violence as they tell their story and pursue the justice they deserve. I was chatting with one of my colleagues who's an attorney in the Philippines, and he was saying it's not just important that we win justice, for survivors of violence and abuse, but how we win it. And that's one of the reasons why IGEN works so hard to train judges, prosecutors, and law enforcement around the world in trauma-informed care so that the court proceedings themselves are survivor-centered. Um, if you're interested in having myself or another one of my IGEN colleagues across Canada come and speak to your church congregation, gathering of peers or coworkers in an office tower or on Parliament Hill, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can reach me at RPI, or sorry, excuse me, Robin, uh, Padani is my name, R-P-A-D-A-N-Y-I at IJM.ca. That's R-P-A-D-A-N-Y-I at IJM.ca. Excuse me. And I'll post it here in the chat as well. You can also go to IJM.ca slash speakers to request a speaker for IJM Canada to come to your church, workplace, or classroom. I'm in based in here in Alberta, but I have fantastic colleagues across Canada and internationally. And at IGM Canada, we've really been entrusted with the stories of survivors of violence and modern day slavery to be good and sensitive stewards to their experience and their reality. And we want to invite all Canadians to join us in helping to bring the kind of protection so that people are never enslaved, never exploited, and never abused in the first place. We all have a role to play, and I really hope you'll join us. Thank you so much for the Center of Public Speaking for having IJM Canada to sponsor this webinar. Thank you, our panelists, and thank you so much for being generous with your time today to join us.